Hey, look, it's another one of those Voyager episodes that would probably play better for people who didn't watch TNG. This is a review of the Star Trek Voyager episode, The Raven. If you have not seen this episode and you don't want to know what Seven of Nine thinks of Neelix's cooking, be warned, spoilers beyond this point. Seven of Nine begins receiving a Borg homing beacon and is drawn to a mysterious, uncharted planet where she finds not her evil twin. Although, now that I've said that out loud, Seven having a lore-style evil twin could have been pretty great. Oh, uh, well. Let's see what they did instead. Seven and Janeway are hanging out in Janeway's holodeck simulation of Leonardo da Vinci's workshop, where Janeway is attempting to give Seven a sculpting lesson. Seven's not really taking to it, though. She's like, what's the point of this? Janeway says, it's a relaxing activity, and it's creative. Seven's like, creativity is irrelevant. Janeway's like, you sound like a Borg. Or a studio boss. Something in the workshop does catch Seven's eye, however, this model of Da Vinci's design for a glider. As she stares at it, Seven has a flashback, or something, to being aboard a Borg vessel, hearing a voice call out her human name, Annika, while she is chased by Borg drones and an ominous black bird. In sickbay, after the opening credits, Seven tells the doctor that she's been having experiences like this a lot lately. Hallucinations, waking dreams, whatever they are, about being on Borg ships or pursued by Borg. And always there's a bird. While I'm experiencing these visions, I feel fear, Seven says, but that doesn't make any sense. I was raised by the Borg. I don't fear them or hate them. I hate you people, not the Borg. The doctor's like, eh, I'll figure it out. In the meantime, report to the mess hall and tell Neelix to feed you. It's time you got some food in you. Seven's like, you want me to eat? In this outfit? While Seven goes to the mess hall, Janeway reports to the briefing room for a meeting with representatives from an alien civilization called the Bomar. If Voyager can take a shortcut through their territory, it'll shave a few months off the trip back to the Alpha Quadrant. But the Bomar aren't going to make it that easy. First of all, they're wearing little wire cages on their heads, and aliens that wear little wire cages on their heads just never turn out to be nice, easygoing people, you know? Also, the little wire cages on their heads have handles on the sides, about which I have no further questions, thank you very much. The Bomar informed Janeway, Chakotay, and Paris that they would be happy to grant Voyager passage through their space as long as Voyager sticks to this absurdly circuitous route they've mapped and submits itself to a bunch of checkpoints along the way. Janeway's like, if we do it your way, it'll take so long, we might as well not even do it. Can we perhaps find our way to agreeing on a shorter route? We cut away from those riveting negotiations to the mess hall, where Seven has arrived with a list of dietary requirements from the doctor. Neelix takes one look at the specific itemized list the doctor has prepared, tosses it aside, and tells Seven, why not just try my special of the day instead? It'll take care of your nutritional needs and be much more enjoyable to eat. Enjoyment is irrelevant. You sound like the CEO of an entertainment company. Neelix prepares Seven's meal. They make small talk about this one time the Borg assimilated a ship full of Neelix's species and how they made excellent drones because of their muscle density. Neelix is like, how nice! He serves Seven her meal at a table and invites her to sit. She's like, sit? In this outfit? But she sits, and we watch for several minutes as Neelix instructs her step by step on the basic mechanics of eating, and then she gets another flashback of a Borg drone doing a Bat Boy impression, and a little Borg sprocket pops up on her hand, and she's suddenly all like, You will be assimilated! and shoves Neelix down and walks out of the mess hall. Janeway's ongoing negotiations with the face cage crew are interrupted by the ship going to red alert on account of Seven's switching to resistance's futile mode. Cage face number one is like, you've got a Borg on your ship? Why do you have a Borg on your ship? And Janeway's like, if you haven't been watching the show, I'm not going to explain. Just keep out of my way. Seven shoots and sashays her way through the ship to the shuttle bay, her Borg shields reactivating and allowing her to brush off phaser hits and pass easily through force fields. She boards a shuttlecraft, blasts her way out of the hangar, and flies off into Bomar's space. 
Cage face number one tells Janeway, We'll take it from here. You just keep out of our territory and we'll find your rogue Borg and kill her real good. After the face cage contingent leaves, Tuvok and Paris sneak across the Bomar border in a shuttlecraft and catch up to Seven. Tuvok beams himself aboard Seven's shuttle, but she subdues him easily and confines him behind a force field. Back on Voyager, Janeway has Harry and Bellana download Seven's personal logs from the cargo bay where she's been staying in her Borg alcove. After translating them from Borgese, Harry shares the logs with Janeway, who has been hanging out in Seven's alcove like a creepy weirdo, and Janeway realizes that the scary bird Seven describes seeing in her visions might be a raven. That makes a light bulb go on, and Janeway tells Chakotay to scan for any Federation ships in the area that don't belong to them. And take us into Bomar's space. I'll be damned if these cage faces barbecue my Borg, babe. Meanwhile, Seven has explained to Tuvok that she's been receiving a Borg homing beacon. That's the reason for her visions. She's being called to rejoin the Collective. Tuvok tries to tell her that there are no Borg ships anywhere close by, but Seven is insistent. When they reach the source of the signal, she will be assimilated once again, and all will be well. But if that's true, why is she still so afraid? I don't know. It's weird. But hey, look at that! They've arrived at the planet where the homing signal is coming from. It seems to be originating aboard a ship on the surface of the planet's moon. Tuvok volunteers to beam down with Seven. She's like, are you sure? You'll get assimilated. There's probably a whole mess of Borg down there. Tuvok's like, I'll be fine. They beam down and trace the signal to the wreck of a small Federation ship sitting on the edge of a cliff. The ship has been partially assimilated by the Borg. Once inside the ship, Seven locates the console, sending out the homing beacon and shuts it off. As she explores the ship, she finds the registration plaque. The Raven. That's the name of the ship. And then it all comes flooding back. This was her ship. Her parents' ship. They lived here. Her parents were scientists. Then the Borg came. Her parents tried to fight back. The ship was going to crash. The Borg took them away, and then she was Borg. Tuvok theorizes that the homing signal must have become active after the ship began to be assimilated and has been transmitting ever since it crashed 20 years ago. Voyager just recently passed into range of the signal, which is why Seven has been having her scary Borg Raven visions. No time to ponder that, however. The Face Cage Brigade has arrived, and their ships are firing on the Raven. They're shooting at a defenseless, decades-old, crashed ship from orbit. What a swell bunch of face-caged folks. The Raven starts to collapse, and their exits are blocked. Tuvok starts to clear some debris away from the hatch. Seven, come help me pick this stuff up! Heavy lifting in this outfit? Voyager arrives on the scene, takes out the weapons of the face cage fleet, and beams up Tuvok and Seven, who have made it outside just in time to see the Raven slide off the edge of that cliff it was sitting on. Later, after Voyager has left face cage space and Janeway has told him to shove their shortcut up their wire-framed asses, Seven returns to the Da Vinci holodeck program. Janeway joins her, and Seven talks of how, since she returned from the Raven, She's been imagining what her life would have been like without the Borg if her parents had raised her instead. Janeway tells her that if she's ever curious, she can read about her parents on the ship's computer. It seems they were kind of famous. They have a Wikipedia article and everything. Seven's like, cool, maybe I'll do that. Good night. And that's the end. You can tell from episodes like this that the writers of Voyager decided to make an effort with Seven of Nine. She was added to the series to juice the sex appeal and hopefully improve the ratings, but once they had her, the creators realized, hey, she's a fresh character, someone who hasn't been ruined by three years of our half-assed bullshit, like almost everyone else on this show. We can do it right this time. And they kind of did. And The Raven is a decent early example of that effort. Seven has an arc that naturally suggests itself due to the basic concept of her character, and that's the best kind of character arc, if you ask me, because it feels organic. She's taken by the Borg as a child. She grows up with them. They are all she knows. Then she's liberated and has to not only discover her own humanity and individuality, but also learn how to work within a group that isn't run by a ruthless, unfeeling hive mind. There are certain steps we would expect a person on that journey to take, certain questions we would expect that person to answer, or at least ask. 
I'm not talking about how to eat. I could do without that whole scene. I'm talking about Seven having a kind of relapse and jumping on her first opportunity to return to the Borg. She's troubled by the visions she's having. She's confused by the fear she feels, but she assumes they're the product of a Borg homing signal. And she thinks that when she reaches the origin point of that signal, she'll be able to return to the collective, to the only home she can remember ever having, to a place that is familiar and comfortable, where she might only be a drone, but at least she knows who she is. That's what she wants, and it's a very important part of the episode that there doesn't come a moment where she doesn't want it anymore. She doesn't decide, actually, I prefer life on Voyager. I'm choosing to stay there instead of rejoining the Borg. She finds the Raven and realizes that she's been mistaken, and rejoining the Borg is not an option. Things like this happen to people who are trying to overcome an addiction or have recently left cults. The pull of the thing they're trying to get away from is still there. They still want it. Like Seven still wants to be part of the Borg. That part of the episode feels very authentic. So does what Seven finds at the end of her journey to return to the Borg. She thinks she's going home in one sense, but she winds up going home in another unexpected sense. She finds the remains of her life before the Borg, the life she only remembers in faint images and terrifying flashes. Seven was fleeing back to a world of familiarity and comfort, but is instead forced to confront two very uncomfortable realities. First, the Borg aren't here and she's not going back to the Collective. Second, the life she had before the Borg, where she was loved and cared for by her parents, isn't here either. It's gone because the Borg destroyed it. She can't go back to either of the places she wants to go back to, not to the Borg and not to her old life as Annika. She's stuck here, left to do the best she can with the life she has. She is who she is. This is all very compelling stuff, and Jerry Ryan as Seven handles it beautifully. She cuts Seven's usual calm aloofness with just the right amounts of confusion and fear in the early portions of the episode as she tries to figure out what's going on with these visions. And when she and Tuvok are aboard the Raven at the end, she turns up that confusion and fear until we find Seven cowering behind a computer console terrified, like the child she was when the Borg abducted her. It's a vulnerable and very effective performance. The problem for me is, as I alluded to in my smart-ass opening line, in terms of plot, a lot of this is very similar to the TNG episode Brothers, where Data detects a homing signal that turns out to be from his father, Dr. Sung, and goes into android commando mode in order to leave the ship and get to the source of the signal. It's not an exact beat-for-beat -beat remake or anything, but when Seven is making her way through the corridors, evading security, thwarting force fields, using the transporter to make her final escape, it all plays as very derivative. If you've never seen that TNG episode, I don't suppose it would be a problem, but I have, and so have quite a few others in the audience for this episode, I would guess. Another issue I have with the episode is the way it chooses to use its characters other than Seven. Early on, as Seven is beginning to deal with her Borg Raven visions, she's partnered with Captain Janeway. This feels natural, since Janeway has taken on a mentor-surrogate mother role for Seven since Seven joined the crew. The first two scenes are Seven and Janeway in the holodeck, then Seven, Janeway, and the Doctor in sickbay. When Janeway leaves sickbay to deal with the face cage freaks, she gives Seven a reassuring squeeze on the arm and promises to help her through whatever these visions are. So far, so good. But then, after Seven leaves Voyager and takes the shuttlecraft to eventually find the Raven, she's accompanied by Tuvok. It's Tuvok who tries to talk Seven into returning to Voyager. It's Tuvok who is with Seven on the Raven when she puts it all together and realizes what's been going on. While there's nothing wrong with the pairing of Tuvok and Seven, it doesn't really work for this episode. Tuvok and Seven, at this point in Seven's run on the show, don't really know each other. They eventually become friends. Makes sense. They have similar personalities and other things in common, but they aren't friends yet. Their experience together in this episode can be viewed as the starting point of their friendship. And again, I don't have a problem with that either. 
But if Tuvok was going to be the person with Seven at the end of The Raven, then he should have been the person with her at the beginning of the episode, too. Having Seven start out the journey she takes in this episode with Janeway, only to get handed off to Tuvok for the payoff, deprives the story of an emotional through-line that it would have greatly benefited from. I wish that either Tuvok had been with Seven at the start of the episode instead of Janeway, or Janeway had been with Seven aboard the Raven at the end instead of Tuvok. Having Tuvok be the one to chase after Seven and get aboard the stolen shuttle with her makes sense in terms of his job on the ship. He's the security guy. He should be the one chasing after escaped rogue crew members. But it doesn't make sense emotionally given how the episode started. And if something in a story doesn't make emotional sense, I don't give a shit if it makes perfect in-world practical sense. I'm not here to watch people realistically perform their assigned duties as though they are real people in a real military. It's not real. It's Star Trek. Starfleet is a conceit created to facilitate story. I'm here for the story. Turning back to elements of the episode that do work for me, I really like the Bomar. What contemptibly petty, self-important little turds they are. On a visceral level, they're just instantly hateable. God, I love them. The Raven was written by Brian Fuller from a story by Fuller and Harry Doc Clore and directed by LeVar Burton. And while I can't say I love it, I do like it. Not everything works, but what works outweighs what doesn't. This is a Seven episode, and Seven's story in it comes off well, despite being a little derivative and compromised by the unnecessary Janeway to Tuvok transfer midway through. When Seven is trying to return to the Borg Collective, it's understandable and authentic. When she's remembering her assimilation and feeling the fear and grief from the loss of her family, we feel it too. That's the important stuff. The episode is on solid footing as long as its creators remember that and only falters when they forget. Those are my thoughts on The Raven. What do you think of this episode? Please share your thoughts with me in the comments. If you'd like to support this channel, and I sure wish you would if you can afford it, you can do so by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash steveshives, becoming a channel member by clicking the join button, or by making a one-time gift by clicking the thanks button, or via PayPal or Venmo. Links are in the description. Please join me next time as I continue this batch of reviews of Borg episodes. Next up, a show from Voyager's fifth season titled Drone. See you then. Thanks for watching, and take care, everybody.